It is my honor and privilege to introduce uh, Mr. Barry Schwartz, who is Vice President of Connex, one of our supporting partners for the last few years. We are truly uh, delighted to have this uh, relationship grow, Barry. And I, uh, you know, both John and I uh, really, really help appreciate the help and support you give us to reach out and invite such uh, illustrious uh, speakers we have in your session today. So on to you, sir. Uh, thank you, Ani. Uh, just to reintroduce myself, I'm Barry Swartz. Uh, I'm Vice President of Connects, the America-Israel Business Connector, an almost 30-year-old nonprofit, non-governmental organization with a mission to connect Americans and Israelis in business, specifically in six Southeast states, North and South Carolina, Georgia, Tennessee, Alabama, and Mississippi. Um, we, as Ani said, we're a supporting partner and participant on the planning committee of this very effective global business uh, conference and forum. Uh, again, my compliments to Ani, to John, to the planning committee, to the sponsors and supporting organizations. Uh, uh, the substance of this conference over the past day and a half have been uh, uh, superior, absolutely superior. Um, so just to give everybody a context of Israel and global manufacturing in the Southeast, um, uh, which has some relevance to our speakers today, they both have connections to Israel in terms of uh, their work. Um, Israel uh, has contributed to the manufacturing ecosystem in the Southeast. We have four Israeli manufacturing companies in South Georgia, uh, plus uh, one of the largest solar energy fields in the United States. Um, we have one manufacturing operation in Alabama, several in South, South Carolina. Um, and uh, clearly the Southeast US is a global manufacturing destination. Uh, due to the recent Abraham Accords that I'm sure you're all familiar with, uh, I'm personally, and Connex is experiencing, a triangulization of global business. With US headquarters of international companies being in touch with me, uh, who have done business in the Arab world, uh, wishing for introductions in Israel. So I think it's going to be a very interesting time. Imagine if the U.S. Uh, had not had relationships with Canada and Mexico, two of its largest trading partners, uh, and there was a sudden rapprochement after a half century of not doing business. What a remarkable impact it would have on our economy. So the peace accords present a, a great opportunity uh, in manufacturing as well. So we have two special guests for our session today with different experiences. Our format will allow both of our speakers to speak for about 15 minutes uh, about their companies and their approach to global manufacturing. I'll then moderate some questions uh, and some discussion with our speakers and then open it up for everybody for Q&A. So we're gonna begin with Scott Ellison, who I see on the screen. Uh, Scott Ellison is the Chief Executive Officer and Co-Founder of East West Manufacturing. Uh, as the CEO and Co-Founder, Scott has played a pivotal role in the company's growth. In addition to overseeing East West global operations, Scott is well recognized in the industry and very active in the company's acquisition efforts. Before co-founding East West, Scott was Vice President of Offshore Manufacturing and Logistics for Diversitech Corporation. Previously, he co-founded ITS Limited, an EMS manufacturer in Asia that makes automobile components and electronic assemblies and began his career as a manufacturer, manufacturing and industrial engineer producing medical instruments for Boston Scientific. He also worked for several years as a management consultant for PwC, focusing on logistics strategy and operations. Uh, Scott, Scott grew up just outside of Milwaukee and attended Culver Military Academy in Indiana. He holds a degree in industrial and systems engineering from the University of Florida and has been working in global manufacturing distribution for over 20 years. 
So Scott, thank you for taking the time to be with us and I'll let you introduce yourself further, your company, the work you've done and uh, some of the perspectives we discussed in preparing for the session. Uh, thank you, Barry. Uh, and uh, thanks, Ani, for, for inviting me to this. Um, uh, so uh, I, I think it's, I, it's interesting to talk about how uh, we're, you know, we're a global manufacturing company. Um, we do quite a bit now also in, in product design to support our customers as well as distribution and, uh, and helping them manage uh, logistics uh, to their customers. Uh, we've evolved a lot over the years and, it, and we're really in an interesting time now with uh, shifting supply chains uh, around the world, uh, particularly out of China. And so if I, if I look back, you know, East West, the company I founded nearly 20 years ago, we're in the business of, uh, we like to say manufacturing products that we believe make the world a better place. Um, and, uh, and for us, that's products that make the world smarter, cleaner, healthier, and safer. Uh, we've, we do a lot of different things. Uh, we help our companies as their manufacturer uh, or partner with, with other OEMs uh, in manufacturing products. Examples would be, we have a whole division that does uh, medical and wellness products. So we're involved in making ventilators, respirators. Uh, we do EEG caps. We do um, uh, high-end exercise fitness uh, products for companies like Wahoo Fitness. Um, that's one division. We have another division that does uh, robotics and automation. Uh, so there's a lot of robotics technology out there and, and we've been involved very early on in developing um, components and sub-assemblies for the robotics industry. Uh, we do a lot of smart IoT devices, connected devices. That's an area that's growing quite rapidly. Things that sense and communicate into the cloud uh, off uh, over a variety of different industries. And then we have a lot of core industrial products for um, for many of the big uh, industrial OEMs uh, that you all would know, companies like um, Johnson Controls or Eaton Corporation or or so on. And so uh, these all all these industries have, have uh, had strong tailwinds in them over the last four or five years. And you know, looking back, you know, 20 years ago, our job was to help them set up global supply chains. Uh, we expanded rapidly throughout China. Uh, you know, today we probably still have an active supply base of 350 to 400 factories in China that are making products for us. Uh, we also own some of our own factories in China, particularly in the way of electric motors. We then expanded into Vietnam uh, to continue to drive uh, down cost and quality and support high volume uh, output. And then, uh, and then we expanded into India five or six years ago. Um, and that was really around metals, metals processing, uh, casting, steels, forgings, and so on. And so we built out this tremendous supply chain capability and we saw the impact that was having on our customers, both supporting their domestic operations and also helping them in their you know, market share. And so we decided uh, back about four or five years ago that while we were very good at cost and quality, uh, we, we always struggled in uh, in developing new products very quickly. Um, it was just tough, even though we have a big engineering team, we've got 150 engineers in the company. When products are being developed and you know, on, on the other side of the world, it just takes time. And so we thought it would be great to have that capability in the US to help launch products quickly. We were never very good at high mix, low volume. Uh, and, uh, and so we decided that we needed to start building out our own manufacturing base uh, throughout North America. And so we did our first acquisition in, in uh, Raleigh uh, back in, uh, I guess it was just almost three years ago now. Uh, they were in the space of doing wire and, industrial wire and cable assemblies for companies like General Electric and Honeywell, and these are big you know, industrial application products. And they also did some box build and electronic assembly. And our goal in buying them was to create value by by being able to leverage our spend, leverage our global supply chain, leverage our operational capabilities, our logistics, all the things that East West can bring to the table to create value and to grow them as an operation. So that then led to another acquisition in Charlotte that does high-end electronics. 
Uh, we then did another acquisition in Boston. And, and so today we've completed six acquisitions across North America. Uh, we're working on our, our seventh right now in Canada. Uh, we have roughly a thousand employees now in the, in the US, um, almost 3000 globally. And we're, we're growing very quickly. And this whole hypothesis that we, we developed early on about how we can buy these operations in the US or North America and create value leveraging our total global capabilities has really proven out. Uh, and, uh, you know, as an example, the Raleigh operation, um, you know, they were not a big facility. They had 200 employees, uh, relatively uh, you know, unsophisticated supply chain capabilities, not very strong in engineering. Uh, and just in a matter of two years, we've been able to double their size uh, in, in revenue. And, and that's come from our ability now to do more for their customers, uh, where they, before they were considered kind of a small shop for lower volume. You know, now we can get in there and talk about a much bigger solution. We can leverage bringing in components from around the globe. Uh, bringing them into Raleigh and then turning that into a full full scale assembly. And so very exciting for us. Um, it's it's a definitely a shift. You know, I've always thought what I call the kind of all of all all the above uh, approach to global manufacturing where there's not one site or the other. It's all sites working together uh, as a family uh, to to figure out how best to serve their customers and we always determine that where best to manufacture a product is never just one location. It's, it always depends on the product and the customer's requirements and what their needs are. And so that's uh, really playing out as to how we look at setting up unique supply chains for, for all of our customers. And as you can imagine now with the tariffs, um, that's creating a shift. Uh, we're getting a lot, of, a lot of folks calling us, asking us what we can do to support them. Uh, in, in duplicating supply chains out of China. Uh, and we're a great solution to that. Our, our biggest operation is in Vietnam. Uh, we've got, uh, it's a full uh, turnkey uh, facility that does a lot of sophisticated electronics and plastics. Uh, we've, we're investing heavily in Costa Rica right now. We've got a nice facility down there. Uh, and so all of this is kind of coming together to, to allow us to be very nimble in moving products around while still making sure that we're giving our customers the best, the best solution. So um, I think that's a pretty good introduction, Barry. I'll stop there, and and uh, and we can let um, let you go, let you ask questions if if you have some. Great, um, Scott. Thank you very much. Could you just expand a little bit uh, before I turn to Jay on the acquisition piece? Why acquire existing facilities as opposed to building your own? Uh, in a custom way, what's the advantage? Is it a is it a, a more expeditious way of entering the marketplace? Um, and yeah. <clears throat> really, it's it's um, the, the, it takes a, in our space. I mean, we're we're um, we're a business services company, and the companies we do business with have to have a high degree of trust in us uh, in in what we do. And developing those relationships takes a lot of time. And so what we want to do, we're moving fast. We've been growing the company north of 30% a year for, I mean, since I started the company, we start, we've grown better than 20% a year. And since we started acquisitions, now we're growing faster than 30% a year. And leveraging the relationships that these companies have with the kinds of companies we want to work with just really speeds up the process. And so um, we're buying a core set of capabilities, but most importantly, we're buying what we think are really important relationships that we can leverage. And what I like to say is it's, it's like, you know, you buy the restaurant, but we just made the menu uh, three times bigger, right? So, so there's now the offering, it, you know, if, if you're working for a company like Honeywell, you know, there's, there's a huge amount of work that can be done there. And, and usually these companies, maybe they're doing a small sliver of what's possible. And now we can have a much bigger conversation. You know, we're one of the few companies in our space that we've identified that has this onshore, nearshore, offshore capability. And you can move products throughout the entire east-west ecosystem without ever losing your customer-facing team. So all the, all the relationships and everything are maintained. The engineering teams are there. And you know, if, you, if, if you get to a point where you want to scale it into another region, we can do all that without having to take on the risk of moving from one supplier to the next. Okay. 
Great, very helpful. So we already have questions in the queue for you, but we're gonna turn to Jay first and, uh, and then uh, we can come back and uh, I have some questions. I'm sure the audience has lots of questions and it's, uh, uh, it's fascinating comparing and con contrasting what you do with others. And in that vein, uh, I wanna introduce Jay Neely, uh, who I've known for a number of years now. Jay is the Vice President of Law and Public Affairs uh, of the Gulfstream Aerospace Corporation. Gulfstream designs, develops, manufactures, markets, services, and supports the world's most technologically advanced business jet aircraft. Jay came to Gulfstream in 1999 after serving at the Atlanta office of Paul Hastings, Janowski, and Walker. I'd be interested to know if that law firm still exists. Doesn't sound familiar to me. Jay has served as legal counsel supporting the company's sales supply chain, product support, intellectual property, and global partnerships. It's amazing how uh, uh, the legal and public affairs division of the company probably has the greatest big picture of a manufacturing company of anybody because they're in, inextricably linked to all the different operations. Jay earned his law degree from UJ School of Law and a bachelor's degree from Vanderbilt. So it's an all SEC panel today. We have Florida and we have Georgia. He's a board member and Vanderbilt. He's a board member of the Georgia Chamber of Commerce, the Savannah Area Chamber and Leadership Georgia. Uh, so without further ado, Jay, I know he has a PowerPoint and Ani was going to put it up on the screen. And, and if you could just instruct Ani when you need to have things change, Jay, that would be great. Thanks, Mary. Uh, and thanks to um, Ani and the rest of the team for having me uh, having me join. Uh, you alluded to the fact that I have a fun job at Gulfstream playing with airplanes, and that's definitely the case, especially for a guy like me who my first attempt at a real career was actually flying airplanes as a as a professional pilot. So uh, I'm sort of a bit about like uh, uh, a bit a bit having been thrown into my own briar patch. So I think. To um, orient everybody uh, following Scott's lead in terms of giving an overview of the company uh, of Gulfstream, um, we've got a, slide, a PowerPoint slide on it. If we can bring it up, that's great. No worries if it doesn't work. There we go. So go ahead and go to the first slide if you would. And to the next slide, please. So Gulfstream is, as Barry was kind enough to, to elaborate on in the uh, introduction, we build business jets. Uh, we do some other things with our airplanes that I'll talk about in a little bit. A uh, quick history of Gulfstream uh, to orient you because we are talking about uh, manufacturing and high tech in the Southeast. Uh, the Gulfstream started as a division of Grumman uh, with operations up in Bethpage, New York and Long Island. Uh, the first Gulfstream product was the G1, a turboprop, which was actually the first first aircraft ever designed from scratch specifically to be a business, business aircraft, a prior business aircraft up to that point had been modified uh, military aircraft or airliners. In, um, uh, in, in the 1960s, the, uh, uh, the company, Grumman at the time, the Gulfstream division, decided to move into the jet age. And with moving into the jet age, uh, wanted to separate the Gulfstream operations from other operations at Beth Page, did a nationwide search, and ultimately landed on, pun intended, uh, landed on Savannah, Georgia as the location for Gulfstream's new headquarters. Uh, we've been here uh, ever since, ever since 1967, uh, started with 100 employees. Today, worldwide, we have uh, approximately 15,000. Uh, roughly 10,000 of those are here in Savannah. Uh, Savannah is, uh, continues to be our worldwide headquarters and, and um, obviously from the headcount uh, here in Savannah by far our largest operation. We've got 13 major lake locations worldwide, so 12 others outside of Savannah. I'll touch on some, not all of that here in just a bit. Uh, in terms of our workforce, the most valuable asset of any company, of course, is, is its workforce. And, um, and we're proud that 25% of our U.S. workforce are uh, military veterans. Great match uh, for um, uh, co uh, culture and attention to detail, so on and so forth. Next slide, if you would. So here's what we do. This is our product line. We have seven airplanes in the fleet right now. Um, uh, six of those are in production. The G700, which is our new flagship, is, uh, is in flight test. It's not yet been certified, but will be certified here relatively shortly. To, um, to orient you, I'm always asked, what, what would it cost to drive one of these off the lot? Uh, the G280, uh, it's about a $25 million airplane up to the G700, 
It's about a $75 million airplane. Uh, G650ER and the G700 both, as you can see on the slide, have the same range. Uh, they, these, these airplane, all of these airplanes are built uh, for uh, transoceanic flight. Uh, they, are, they are designed to be part of global commerce. Uh, to put things in perspective, um, the, the, the uh, you know a handful of us could get uh, on the 650ER or the G700 in Savannah, take off and fly nonstop to Beijing. Uh, so it's a, these are very long-range airplanes. The the um, uh, the G280 uh, part of not by no means our only connection to Israel is very alluded to. The G280 uh, is is an is an air, aircraft that it ties us. Uh, a strong tie to, to Israel. Let me just quickly explain how our operations work, manufacturing operations work for this to make sense. Build airplanes in two phases. Green airplane phase is everything you need about the airplane to make it fly, wings, engines, cockpit, so on and so forth, but nothing that makes it pretty or comfortable. So no uh, exterior paint or passenger interior. The green airplane manufacturing for the G280 is done in Israel by Israel Aerospace Industries. And, uh, and, the, and the airplanes when completed are flown under their own power to a Gulfstream facility in Dallas, Texas for the interior and the, and the paint. The balance of the airplanes, what we call our large cabin segment, uh, all of those airplanes are green manufactured in Savannah. And then, uh, and then the completions are done in Savannah, Appleton and Long Beach, California. Uh, next slide, please. So the, although the bulk of our business is what I would call true business aircraft uh, customers where uh, a business or in some instances, uh, individuals use the airplane for you know, just standard passenger uh, transportation. Uh, that that represent, represents about 90% of our business. Uh, roughly 10% though is what we call special missions. And the special mission airplanes fall into two categories that you see illustrated here. Uh, the one at the top, that's a, a, um, a C-37B that's operated quite obviously by the US government. Um, they These are, uh, VIP transports that are operated by the government, but they have special communications gear and other other things to keep them safe in a hostile environment. The um, uh, 89th Air Force that operates Air Force One, for example, operates quite a number of those, even occasionally using the Gulf Streams as as um, uh, as Air Force One. Uh, the balance of the special mission airplanes are what I call true special mission, where we take our basic airframe and modify it to do do something other than transport passengers. And so in the middle picture, uh, that's a good example. That's a, a CAEW, uh, it's the program it's, it's part of is called the CAEW program. Uh, it's a signal intelligence program that we, we, we've we done uh, primarily or additionally for the um, Israeli Defense Forces. So the Israeli military operates the CAE configuration and some other um, similar Gulfstream configurations, and then we did that program uh, in concert with, um, with a, a division of, of IAI. So again, that strong connection to, to, the, um, to, to, to Barry and my friends in Israel. Uh, the last one example is, um, as you can tell, it looks like an air ambulance, and that's exactly what it is. Uh, we have quite a number of those operating around the world to, to um, uh, among other things, take uh, critical care patients who are in parts of the world that don't have top-notch uh, medical uh, facilities and, and get them safely to a destination and, and capable of even doing major surgeries in flight. Next please, slide, please. So technology, uh, we are, we build, sell airplanes, but we are very much a high-tech company. Uh, we have 100% uh, of Gulfstream's R&D uh, facilities, engineering resources, and other resources are here in Savannah, Georgia and have been since the, since the move to Savannah in 1967. Uh, you ask, well, what, what does Gulfstream spend its R&D dollars and resources on? Uh, of course, it's all the obvious airplane things like how to wake up, make a wing more efficient and reduce drag and, and reduce emissions from, lower emissions from the engines, et cetera. And, and, and certainly we put a lot, of, uh, a lot of focus on that, how to make the flight deck uh, more efficient for the pilots. But we, we also do a tremendous amount of research in areas that are not so obvious to somebody not familiar with the uh, industry. And you know, a key example of that is the is the picture in the middle. Uh, I suspect many in the audience re recognize that as a as a wall in an acoustics lab. And, and we we use the acoustics lab, a very sophisticated acoustics lab that I'll elaborate on in just a second. 
Um, we use that both to to uh, develop technologies that to make the aircraft more quiet to those on the ground, uh, and also to make the interior cabin uh, more quiet. So. Uh, Think about the last time you were on a commercial airliner. Um, it's a loud environment, even if you're talking to the person sitting next to you. Uh, in the G650, the G500, 600, 700, and newest airplanes, uh, those airplanes in flight at cruise at 0.925 Mach, which is their maximum cruise speed, has an interior sound level roughly equivalent to a, an office conference room with air conditioner on. Um, you can easily talk to someone at the other end of the cockpit, or excuse me, the cabin, uh, in normal voices. So that's made possible by the technologies that we have. We have a, uh, I grew up in Georgia and, and, and um, never thought of Georgia as being a hot spot for seismic activity, but the lab that we have is so sophisticated, so sensitive that it, it literally sits on what I call shock absorbers. It's a uh, acoustically isolated platform, I think is what the, what the uh, engineers will, how they'll describe it to you, but it, it, um, it has to be acoustically isolated because of the, uh, seismic activity here in Savannah that would disrupt the uh, the um, the readings and, and the like. Um, other thing I'll highlight just to, as quickly is that the top you see um, uh, an odd looking beast that looks like a skeleton of an airplane and that's really what it is. Uh, we have an integrated test facility or ITF we call it where we literally build an entire airplane each for the models under development we build the entire airplane inside in a lab of course, it's as you can see, it's not a real wing or a real fuselage, but everything else about the airplane, other than the engines and the APU, auxiliary power unit, which are simulated, everything else is exactly what goes on the airplane, down to the to the wires, the connectors, landing gear operates, and so on and so forth. So by the time uh, the G700, our newest airplane in development, development, as I mentioned, by the time it, the real airplane had its first real flight we had thousands and thousands of hours of quote flight in the lab flown uh, by our test pilots, et cetera. So, so um, in the interest of time, I'll, I'll, I'll stop with that, but I do want to emphasize that, that Gulfstream is very much a high tech company headquartered in Savannah with, that is the Southeast obviously with hundred percent of our high tech operations R and D uh, right here. Next slide, please. Uh, Sustainability is such an important issue these days. I just wanted to briefly highlight that uh, with this standout slide, that that, that R&D absolutely includes uh, sustainable alternative fuel and, and other sustainability uh, focus items. In fact, our demo fleet we operate currently operate on a, a synthetic aviation fuel blend um, that, um, in, you know, that that noticeably uh, noticeably lowers the carbon footprint. Next slide. Getting, getting here to the just the last couple of slides, uh, designing and building and selling the airplanes, um, obviously a huge part of our business, but at Gulfstream, our view is that if, if um, even if you make the world's most technologically advanced airplane, if it breaks and you can't fix it quickly for the customer, they get grumpy. And if, they, if it breaks and, and, um, and, and, and you don't get it fixed quick, quickly enough, excuse me, uh, your customers will get sufficiently grumpy that they, they will buy somebody else's airplane. So we invest heavily in our, what we call our customer support organization. That's everything that, that the customer experiences off the lot, so to speak, to the, to the life cycle of the airplane. Over 4,100 employees in that part of the business and with maintenance facilities scattered, scattered around the world. Next slide. The, this slide is a, is a very important one uh, because it gives you a sense that our business is truly a global business. Um, uh, that wasn't as true up until the early 2000s. Prior to that, about 80% of business aircraft sales were North America, 20% the balance of the world. Uh, that has shifted dramatically uh, in the time since then. As you can you can see here, this is our installed fleet, 65% um, uh, in North America, and then the uh, the balance spread out, uh, as you can see in the numbers, with now 12% in Asia Pacific. Uh, that Asia Pacific number uh, was was very low uh, at the beginning in the year 2000, for example. Um, you know, this has caused us to be be a very global company, and and, um, and and certainly driven a lot of changes in how we operate and how we think. Next slide, please. Uh, how we support that installed fleet. Um, this is our maintenance network. 
uh, composed of Gulfstream facilities, a sister company under the GDE General Dynamics umbrella, Jet Aviation, and, uh, and, and third party uh, operators as well. Next slide. Last but not least, uh, we're, I've, I've mentioned already that any company's most valuable asset is its employees. No matter how good your product, if you don't have the right people in the right place, you will not succeed. And, and consequently, we put a tremendous amount of effort on our workforce development activities. Uh, in the interest of time, I won't even attempt to go into any of the details on that beyond saying uh, one of our key partners is Georgia Tech, and we have a tremendously successful longstanding co-op and intern program with them along with other institutions. So um, uh, next slide, and that, that ends my remarks. Ready for questions. Great. So thank you, Jay. That's a fantastic overview. So I, I'd like to start with a, a question to, uh, to Scott. Uh, we do have uh, several questions on the chat line that I'll uh, I'd be happy to follow up with in a little while. But um, Scott, what, what intrigues me is the industry sectors, uh, which are numerous, uh, that you're involved with in terms, of, uh, in terms of manufacturing globally. So the question I have is, um, is that exclusively customer driven? Uh, are there industry sectors that you've been approached in terms of manufacturing and decided um, those aren't in your sweet spot. They require uh, uh, a, a specialty factories, specialty manufacturing. Are there things that uh, you don't consider and wouldn't consider in terms of uh, uh, manufacturing for clients and customers? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I think there's some there's some core manufacturing processes that that uh, we we think we're pretty good at. Um, Electronics is certainly a category uh, where we can do pretty advanced electronics, particularly for industrial applications. We even make some electronics for the aviation industry. Um, we don't do much in the way of automotive, but so electronics, uh, anything in the metals category, um, particularly highly, um, highly, highly uh, precision, high precision machined or um, we do a lot in, in high um, in die casting, aluminum die casting, plastics. Uh, we have a pretty sizable plastics operation that we own, uh, and so and we're unique in that we have our own uh, tooling capabilities. So we build the tools, run the plastics, and what's nice about that is that that supports all of our facilities globally. So we have 14 facilities and uh, only one plastics operation, and um, which is intentional. And then uh, we do uh, rubber, uh, other industries we stay away from. We don't really do anything in chemicals. Uh, we don't do anything in industrial, uh, in textiles. Um, so the things we, we like making um, box builds, intricate assemblies uh, that are used in a variety of different applications and particularly things that have uh, motors uh, associated with them. We, we like motor technology because motors is going through a similar transition uh, as lighting, where lighting went from incandescent to LED, much more efficient, a lot more smarts and technology that you can incorporate into motors. Um, very similar where you can take efficiencies from 30% on an electric motor now up to 90% uh, and have all kinds of features and things that, that, that um, and so many of our customers are interested in working with us to create a motor solution for them. And of course, all these motors have electronics and cables and plastic housings or metal housings. And so we really like pulling all that together. Um, and is, uh, just, to, just to, you know, sort of uh, add on to the question, is there anything better suited to be manufactured in the United States or particularly in the U.S., either because of workforce, uh, because it needs to be closer to the client that, you know, that sort of mitigated your move to acquire companies in the U.S. and and I know that, I believe you have four manufacturing operations in North Carolina. Yeah, and so, yeah, we, and, we, and, and then Boston and, and uh, in Wisconsin. So if you look at the sites in the U.S., the things that we're trying to direct to those sites uh, fall into a, a few different categories. So um, in, in many cases, we may be putting together a very sophisticated piece of equipment um, 
that requires a lot of engineering involvement with the customer. Uh, you know, we're working on a, a medical device now that it's a blood analyzer. And so they want to they want to qualify the, the, the assembly process uh, in North Carolina. And then and then once we've got that dialed in, uh, they want to ask they want us to duplicate that uh, that line in another country. Uh, and so that that gives them the, the the duplication reduces their risk on the manufacturing side, but also will give them a cost advantage as scale and volumes rise. So they get to get the average costing uh, down. Um, we we also like products that you know maybe have um, uh, relatively low volume and uh, but but have much higher higher mix. These are things that just don't justify setting up uh, and managing in in other regions. Where, where volumes tend to be much more important. So uh, if we're gonna be making tens or hundreds or even in the low thousands of something, uh, we, you know, in terms of a, a complete assembly, uh, we, would, we would typically uh, try and justify to set those up in the US operations. And we make some, we make some case assemblies uh, that are you know, 30 to $40,000 sets of instrumentation per unit. And so, these sorts of things that get really complicated if you're moving them into another region for assembly. And so, so high mix, low volume, uh, what we call NPI, new product introduction, products that need to get qualified locally then maybe get duplicated into another site. These are the areas that we want to try and, and uh, use to, to, to work with our customers in locally. That's fascinating, okay. thank you. Uh, Jay? Um, you spoke about all the innovation, all the technology, all the expertise that uh, Gulfstream has in Savannah, Georgia. Um, has Gulfstream considered widening its industry sector and taking some of the expertise you have in particular areas and mashing them up and uh, using them uh, in manufacturing for a different purpose, whether it be healthcare, or some other industry sector other than aviation? Short answer is no. Now we, we are, our business model and our strategic focus is we, we, we have a, a niche, granted it's a, it's a fairly large niche, but it, we have a niche uh, where you know, we, we have the top brand and have, um, have been, been very successful. And our view is that staying focused on what we do best and sticking to our knitting, so to speak, uh, is the right is the right play for us. Of course, our parent company, General Dynamics, uh, is in a host of other uh, other businesses. So, so we're part of a broader, more diversified operation. But in terms of Gulfstream itself, uh, we are very good at the business aircraft space and then the, the related special mission operations that I, that I mentioned. And um, and that's 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 where we keep our focus. Okay, uh, Scott, back to you. Uh, we have a uh, question online. Do you anticipate a reduction in the supply chain from China? It's a subject that you and I spoke about when we met each other uh, uh, last week and in the years to come. Is that one of the reasons why you're diversifying um, uh, to Vietnam and to other places? Um, and as you grow and diversify, do you expect that there's going to be a change in your organizational structure. So, so two parts of that. Um, without a doubt, we've got a lot of customers uh, approaching us and new customers that are looking to diversify their supply chains out of China. Uh, we're, we're seeing a good bit of that. Uh, maybe they're sole sourced uh, and doing some sort of uh, assembly uh, out of out of China, and they they recognize. Um, and this was happening even before the tariffs. Uh, they were recognizing that China was getting more expensive and they were looking for alternatives to that. With the, the tariffs have only accelerated that trend. Uh, so, and there aren't a lot of places to move production today where in, in a lot of these products where you're going, where you could expect in, in a further reduction in cost. You know, Vietnam is probably one of those places where it, it also, Vietnam also has the right um, infrastructure. You can rely on the, on the power to stay on at the factories. They've got the, 
the port access, you got decent amount of, you know, container uh, traffic into the U.S. You've got access to engineers and uh, it's, you know, places like Ho Chi Minh and, and Hanoi are nice places to stay. Uh, there, there are, you know, you know, Cambodia or, you know, um, Bangladesh. I mean, these, these are places that have lower labor costs, uh, but you're not, you know, it doesn't have the infrastructure of the supply chain to, to support your production. The nice thing, the other nice thing about Vietnam is, is it's very close to China. And so China has access, you know, the, the supply chain capabilities in China, um, I don't think are matched really anywhere else in the world uh, in terms of what their, what the capabilities are and the number of manufacturers. For example, if I need a bare circuit board um, without any components on it, there's probably, you know, three or 400 circuit board manufacturers in Southeast China alone. Um, I don't know how many there are in the US, but I would guess it's probably less than 10% of that, it, it, if that at all, it's, it's very small. And so, and, and the ones in the US would be much more geared towards specialty boards or, or so on. And so um, being close to China is very, very useful for us because we can get a lot of pieces and parts. And so we're shifting more of the high value assembly work out of China. And some of that's coming back to the States, um, uh, but the component side is still very act for us is actually growing in China. We're, we're growing the component side to support our US facilities and our Vietnam facilities and other locations. And, and how we're shifting as a company, um, our Atlanta office where we used to do a lot of, uh, we do, and we still do a lot of interaction with our customers and manage those accounts. We have a lot of project engineers and so forth. The Atlanta office now is turning into more of what I would call a, a service center to support all of our US operations. So I like to call it our help desk. And uh, so things like, um, you know, IT support, HR support, engineering, uh, operations. We have essentially departmental or functional experts and teams in Atlanta, and their job is to, to work with all the different sites uh, in, in North America to make sure that they're, they're helping them and, and uh, learning from one another. Uh, we're big believers in, you know, KPIs and, and, uh, and metrics and, you know, dashboards. And first thing we do with any acquisition is put them on the, the, the core KPIs so that we can see how they're performing and then to quickly identify what they're doing well, what they're not doing well. And then we try and have conversations so that we can, we can drive improvement. And in Atlanta, I think is just going to continue to do more and more of that kind of work as we do more and more acquisitions. And, uh, interesting you mentioned that. I know a number of companies whose headquarters have turned into exactly that. Uh, yeah. And it's a great way to interact with their customers. So as a global manufacturer, what keeps you up at night? What concerns you? Well, I'm what, not, do you uh, what, what, what do you wake up in the morning and say, oh my God? <laughs> um, I don't know. I, 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 there's a lot of, I, re, I really am passionate about, um, helping these operations grow and develop quickly. I, I want, I want us to get re, the, the manufacturing industry in North in the U, United States, in my opinion, is quite fragmented. Um, and there's a lot of, you know, these smaller, uh, family owned operations. I couldn't so I say in every NFL city in America. Uh, that do these high-end electronics and, and do plastics and so on. And we want to be a company that can kind of pull all these together, the, the kind of the best in class and allow us to work together as a family. And then, in, and as that happens, uh, you'll start seeing, um, we'll all benefit from it, right? And so we're, we're, we're well onto that journey right now. We're two or three years in and uh, so far, we've been quite successful in the ones that we've acquired and grown, but I, I just want to keep that momentum going and, uh, and make sure that we get really good at it. Um, so that, that's probably my biggest thing. If I had a second, it would be, you know, I'm not, I'm, I'm a fan of, of free trade and, and uh, I'd like the, um, you know, I'd like to see us continue to have access to global manufacturing capabilities and not turn in on ourselves. I don't, I don't think that's healthy. And so I, I, I'm hoping we don't move more in that direction. Okay, great. Thank you. Jay, can you give us sort of an overview of your competitive environment and sort of following up on the China 
question that I had for Scott. Um, are they moving into your industry sector? Are you concerned about them being a competitive, concerned about intellectual property? So give us a sense of the, uh, your competitive environment. Sure, so all, all of our competitors are outside the US. Uh, our primary competitors are Bombardier in Canada, uh, Dassault in France, and, and increasingly so Embraer down in Brazil. Uh, the, the other big business aircraft manufacturer in the U.S. is, is um, Textron Aviation, which is Cessna Beechcraft, uh, excellent company, but their, their product line, the top of their product line ends about where the, the, the mid-cabin uh, lower part of ours ends, so, so we really, with, with minor exceptions, really don't compete. And, and um, you know, we've, we, we've been very fortunate, uh, I think not by coincidence, but because we've been able to attract the right workforce and talent and stay focused on, on what we do best, but our, our market share is, is um, uh, the largest of all of the, all of the, 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 the others I mentioned. So we, we have a strong market share and we're, we've been very successful in the last number of years um, selling Gulf Streams to people who previously sold those, or excuse me, flew the, those other, other um, aircraft manufacturers aircraft. Uh, on the, on the China question, um, it's a, well, I guess there were a couple of questions embedded uh, in your point. So first, do, do we see them as a competitor today? No, uh, they they do have a, an airliner, the 919, that's under development, although it certainly had more than its share of, of problems. Uh, so they don't currently have uh, an airplane um, publicly in the mix to compete as a business aircraft, but there is absolutely no question in anybody's mind that that is Part of their long-term plan, and and that they will absolutely um, come after our segment of the business in in due course. They're focusing on the airline side first because that's the that's where the volume is. Um, in in terms of the uh, intellectual property concerns, absolutely. The, every everything you read in the paper about um, the the chat, the, excuse me, the threat from that part of the world is very real. Uh, we have and we see it every day in our business. We have a uh, business technology cybersecurity team that that is literally world class. The gentleman that runs that part of the cyber our cybersecurity is a former NSA, and uh, we have a control room that um, that very much looks like it came out of a Hollywood movie. And it's it, we 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 focus on it every single day, both cyber side and the human side. And uh, there's another question from the audience, and that. Uh, that is electrification of aircraft. Is that something that you see in the in the future? Just like we're doing it with uh, automobiles, is uh, aviation travel moving in that direction? Uh, yeah, no question about it. In fact, I I would hesitate even to say in the future. Uh, there are airplanes, prototype airplanes flying today that are that that I I think will be certified in the next next few years. Um, the the, uh, the hybrid hybrid electric, where you've got a, a electric electric propulsion, but on board uh, 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 you know fossil fuel kind of engine, you know, a jet engine driving a, a generator that's generating electricity that in turn is running the engines that propel the airplane. I think I think you'll see a lot of that. The the I'd break it up into really three segments: the 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 very short haul, um, you know, from um, LaGuardia into downtown Manhattan. Uh, you'll see pure pure electrics on that very, very soon, I think. Uh, the medium haul, the 500 mile and below, you'll see how there already are uh, these hybrids. Uh, in fact, a very impressive company in Israel who's flying a prototype right now. And then um, and then the, the, the longer haul in the space, the, the fast longer hauls where, where Gulfstream operates, all of our aircraft, uh, that's that's going to be a very very long way down the road. Uh, the science, and I'm, I know just enough on, about this to, to be dangerous, but the the, um, the 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 science around where we are with electric and even hydro, had, excuse me, electric and hybrid electric is just just not the, the science is just not there. Technology is not there to have an airplane the size and speed of a Gulfstream airplane with the range it needs to do the mission. And what about the whole issue of manned, unmanned aircraft? 
uh, you know, more and more we have drones uh, uh, invented in Israel, I might add, and uh, uh, they seem to be getting larger and larger, but uh, uh, more prevalent in, in, in both uh, military, but also in, in general use. And is, is, that, is that a possibility in the near future? Uh, yes. The technology is already there. You see it with a lot of the military, the predator drones and, and, uh, and the like, uh, where you've got man-operated but unmanned aircraft where somebody from the, the ground is operating an airplane. Uh, there's a lot of that already, not, not in the passenger space. Uh, I think the, that um, the progression that you'll see is, uh, whereas currently all the large aircraft require two pilots, uh, at, at some point down the road, I don't know when, it won't be five years from now, but at some point, I do think you'll see, instead of two live pilots in the cockpit, you'll have uh, one live pilot with a, uh, a person on the ground who uh, jumps in figuratively to help fly the airplane in high workload, landing takeoff, for example. Uh, right now, the technology is not really there to do that on any kind of scale because of the latency problems between between, um, you know, if you had somebody sitting in, in the U.S. trying to land an airplane in, in Paris, that the, the latency problems just aren't, aren't quite solved. Um, with our business, uh, there are a number of us who've had quite a bit of debate around would a, would a person who's paying 30, 50, 60, 70 million dollars for an airplane sit in the back when there's no real human being up front to fly it, uh, just psychologically, emotionally, well, is that something they would accept? Um, I think not, not in not, at least not in my uh, in my lifetime or at least my career. Uh, now I will, I will add that the, the the younger folks, and you can tell by my gray hair, I don't qualify as a younger folk. Uh, <laughs> but the the the, the younger, um, bright, smart people around the company will argue, well, that's true of your generation, but my generation that thinks nothing of getting in, uh, or, or will soon think nothing of getting in an Uber that doesn't have a a real person driving it. They're going to have an entirely different view. Um, yeah, so it's that's my that's my view on the subject. Okay, good. Thank you. No, it's an, it's uh, it's fascinating what what's going to come. Scott, there was a question from the audience that sort of wanted you to be a little bit more precise. I know you addressed it a bit, but you know, any sort of more precise thoughts about nearshoring and the costs associated with it. Um, you know, what are the significant differences, the major costs? Um, can you talk a little bit about robotics and manufacturing and whether, you know, it becomes less of a labor issue as things become more, uh, 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 more ro robotic in terms of manufacturing? So, um, yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll give you, I'll, I'll get very specific. And so, you know, to, to run a, 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 when I look at, the cost to operate a facility in, in anywhere in the, in the globe. I always think of it in terms of what I would think a fully burdened labor hour. So if I take the entire cost of the op operation, the rent, the power, the overhead, and divide it by the direct labor hours, in the US, I'm probably gonna end up with something north of $60 an hour. Um, a very lean operation, you know, maybe I can get into the 40s or 50s, um, but on average, I think we're we're 60 to 70. And um, you know, China today is probably in the, um, if I were to guess, 10 to 15 dollar an hour range um, to to operate their facilities. So still about one fourth of what we would would typically see here. Um, you know, honestly, it still costs me. I, I can still hire. Uh, a full-time person in in China for what it costs for me to pay just for health care for one employee in the U.S. I can hire four people in Vietnam for what it costs for me to pay for health care uh, in the United States. And the skill level of the workers, um, you know, it, it depends. It's easier for me to find folks that do machining and um, CNC work in places like China and Vietnam than it is for me to find them in the U.S. Uh, because we don't have a lot of training and education around these types of areas. Um, so Costa Rica is probably similar in terms of cost uh, to to China, and then you get as is Mexico today. They're they're pretty close. Um, and then on the we're very attracted to Costa Rica because uh, it has a free trade agreement with China. 
and a free trade agreement with the U.S. And so that allows us to bring in a lot of components and materials into Costa Rica, assemble it, turn it into something else, and then ship it into the U.S. or anywhere else we want without any sort of tariffs or duties associated with it, which is something that we would have an advantage on over Mexico. Um, the other thing we love about Costa Rica is just it's, it's, a, it's a wonderful workforce, highly educated, high energy. Um, they're like sponges on, on everything that we've been uh, putting down there. In fact, I think they're going to, within a couple of years, they're going to be probably our, our showpiece manufacturing site, um, particularly in the way of software. Uh, and and the, the, we've, we've launched several new, we're investing heavily in Costa Rica, uh, where I think they're weakest uh, is been on logistics. There's just not enough volume moving in and out of their ports uh, for us, uh, particularly out of the, out of the uh, coming in from Asia. And so everything has to, it, it takes, you know, something that should take four weeks is taking six to eight weeks. Um, and then the, the, the freight costs alone are quite expensive. And that's something we're hoping to fix as we get more and more volume, we can, we can have some more influence there, but um, that's, it's still an area. I think freight out of Asia typically costs us, um, you know, 3% to bring something into the U S and in, in Costa Rica now, it's still almost double that uh, freight in and out of Costa Rica. So that's, that's pretty painful, but um, that, that will get fixed. So yeah, we're, we're, we think, you know, having all of that, the, you know, the onshore, nearshore, offshore, pulling all that together provides the best possible solution for our customers. So you touched in your response to that question on the training education piece for the United States. So, you know, the title of our session focused on how, you know, does the U.S., Southeast U.S. become a global manufacturing region? How does it increase its activity? So what has to be done here for, uh, for there to be more of an attraction uh, for companies to bring their manufacturing operations here? You know, when I go to places, you know, I've, I've, I've certainly done a lot of tra trips to, to China over the years in Vietnam and Mexico. Um, I, you know, some of the things I've seen where, for example, in Mexico, I've been in some of these big industrial parks, they have schools, they have, they have uh, tech technical schools right in the middle of the office of these parks. And you'll walk inside them and you've got, you know, they're teaching students uh, how to operate robots, how to, how, to, how to use CNC machines, how to do advanced manufacturing, how to implement uh, shop floor management systems and do MRP and, and all these things. There's, and, and of course, all the industry around the school is 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 pulling these kids and students into their pro into their their um, their operations. Uh, I'm not, you know, I know there's some of that on, on a select basis in the U.S. where you know big big companies are setting up dedicated or captive programs to support them. But I, I think that's something that we we uh, we could do a lot more of uh, if we're going to try and, and bring more manufacturing here. I just I, I one of our our robotics project that we've been working on now. For many years, the facility we don't own the facility. It's it's, um, but we've we we're their largest customer and we've grown with them for a long time. Um, they have three or four hundred CNC machines running at any given time. Uh, so they have three or four hundred mach CNC machine operators. Um, they've got you know a lot of uh, heavy industry. They have to make their own tooling and equipment and so forth. You know we've got in the U.S. There's, there's nothing like that, particularly at that scale uh, that, I've, that I've come in. And we've done a lot of work to try and find something like that. But just I couldn't imagine trying to even build that here if we wanted to. Where, where are you going to find three or four hundred CNC machine operators? That, that I'm not aware of a place where, where that exists here. Yes, for, for us lay people, can you tell me what a CNC machine does and what it is? Yeah, it's a com, com, it's a computer uh, um, con controlled machine that you you, it, you basically you load up a piece of software into the machine and it cuts out of steel or I mean, plastic in some cases, but mostly steel exactly what you need. So a lot of the the metal parts that go into Gulf Streams are probably being produced on CNC machines. Um, they probably have a lot of CNC operators, but uh, the the so you have to be quite adept at understanding software and and tolerancing and dimensioning and and how how metal operates it 
it's a skill, it's, you know, and it often goes through an apprenticeship to, to, to get um, to, to any level where you can, you can really be um, produce good parts. So you're telling me there's an entrepreneurial opportunity for someone to open up a training program for CNC trainers. Yeah, probably. Yeah, I think so. Okay. Golf so you, probably, you guys probably have a dedicated one, I would imagine, Jay. To, for some Jay, do you, want to, do you want to comment on that and then <laughs> sort of comment on how Gulfstream can not only be a model, but can help bring more uh, manufacturing to the Southeast? Yeah, absolutely. And, and you, you, you sort of hit on one of my favorite subjects. I'm, I'm somewhat evan evangelical about the workforce development piece. I agree with everything Scott said. Um, in the U.S., we've done, we've done a great job of building the best university system or systems in the world, uh, Georgia Tech certainly being a prime, prime example. Uh, but what we've done over the last 40 years, unfortunately, is we've done a huge disservice to, to, to those young people who aren't especially inclined by preference or skill set to, to, to go to a university, but who are very good at the, the trade skills, the advanced trade skills. And, and, um, and, and, and good news is, that at least in Georgia, there's been a concerted effort over the last uh, probably getting close to 10 years uh, to, to really push through, through the, um, the technical colleges and, and other programs, even at the high school level, to first raise awareness that there are some really, really good jobs out there that, that don't require you to go to a four-year college. And, and, um, you know, and I think that's a huge obstacle that we have to get over is we've got teachers in high schools and parents who are convinced that if the student doesn't go straight immediately after high school to a four-year college, they're a failure. And that absolutely could not be farther from the truth. So the first thing we've got to do is, is educate people that that is not the case. Um, you know, I, I can point to, and, and I mean this literally, I can point to airplane mechanics at Gulfstream who are working on the floor, turning riches on airplanes, making more money than people I graduated from law school at, at the University of Georgia with. Um, these, these can be very high paying jobs with great benefits, so on and so forth. We've got to get that message out there and we've got to get the training programs built up. Again, we've made a lot of progress in the technical colleges, the, the, um, um, the, the, the HOPE scholarship expansion. So the key that I hope everybody's familiar with, there are I think 11 or 12 different industries now that are part of the technical college um, um, expanded HOPE program so that anybody looking to take a course that's in those industries can, can go to a technical college in Georgia or completely for free. Aerospace is one of those or other advanced manufacturing uh, industries as well. But we've got to get that skill set built up uh, because Scott's right. You, you know, we, we, we don't have a bunch of CNC machines operating in, in Savannah because in part because of what he described. We do have them operating in other countries, but not here. Mary, I think you're on mute. Yeah, I apologize. I, uh, how's the pandemic uh, impacted uh, these training programs, your uh, program with Georgia Tech? You know, how are these things functioning during the pandemic or are we being set back by the fact that we're not able to function as we have in the past? Is that, or is that a question for me? Yeah, for you, Jay, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, yeah, no question we've been set back. Um, no question at all. Uh, to start with the specific with, with Georgia Tech, uh, we have and have had forever uh, both co-op programs and intern er, internship programs. And the co-op programs, as, as, as most people know, that's part of uh, ongoing rotation through Gulfstream and back to the classes at Tech, et cetera. So the co-op program, uh, we've continued straight through uh, with, with a, minor, um, a minor interruption for the first few months of COVID. Uh, we shut down, for those who could work remotely, uh, we shut down, we, we, we start over again. We, we kept all of our operations going throughout the pandemic. We're critical infrastructure of the U.S. government definitions, but we did work remotely for those who could. That included our co-op students, uh, but we had everybody back, um, uh, every, everybody back working in our facilities by mid-May. And so the co-op program, with that minor exception, is, is continued un, uninterrupted. Uh, the internship program with Georgia Tech and other, other schools that we work with, uh, however, uh, we took, um, because those are, well, for reasons I won't bore everybody with, the, the, um, 
you know, for the internship programs that are more finite in nature in terms of the, the, the time with Gulfstream, we did stop those at the beginning of the pandemic and we were still on pause. We we're considering whether, when, when to reopen the programs and haven't made a decision yet. Um, and then the, you know, the, this, you know, the, the, the challenges with students trying to, high school students trying to work remotely, or excuse me, learn remotely is, is, is also problematic. We have a, uh, aviation um, pathway program that we go through help fund with the Chatham County local school system uh, that's just getting started this year. This, this is the first year of students going through it. It's a joint high school first two years uh, and while in high school dual enrollment with the technical colleges for the last two and although we have been able to keep that program going it's been it, it's definitely been difficult to get the, the same quality of training for the students who are having to uh, take that training remotely. So since I have the lawyer uh, as part of this session, uh, I'll ask you a question that's been uh, certainly top of mind for me is how much is liability part of your consideration in your response to the pandemic? Um, uh, obviously you source parts and you get parts from around the world. Um, how much of that is a concern? How much of that dictates uh, your policy, your practice? I want to make sure I understand the question. As it relates to how, how, how we interact with our employees and the precautions yeah. we give to our employees or, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think employees, um, vendors, uh, customers, all of yeah, them. It, 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 this will sound strange coming from a lawyer, but the, the liability aspect of it is really not our focus. Uh, we're focused on protecting the welfare of our employees and people we interact with. That's the that's the driving force. And and um, you know to to back that up so it doesn't sound like it's just a lawyer talking. At the beginning of the pandemic, we set a set of rules in terms of how we would interact, and we we hired a uh, Harvard-educated infectious disease doctor to advise us on how to set up our protection protective protocols, so on and so forth. We set up our our plans that included testing people coming in, visitors coming in from high risk areas and a whole host of other things. We set that plan up before the Georgia legislature passed the, um, the, the COVID liability protection laws for any business that posts a notice. With those notices now posted, we are immune, like every other business who follows the posting requirements, we're immune from liability. And we have, we have, not, we have not changed our, our processes at all with the exception that we've gotten more strict in, in certain areas as we hit the, the, uh, uh, the most recent, uh, the, the second wave, so to speak. Scott? Protect your, protect your employees and your suppliers and your customers and the business okay. will take care of itself. Scott, your manufacturing operations are global and domestic. Uh, uh, how's the pandemic impacted you? Considerations that you've had to make, supply chain, et cetera? You know, uh, Asia has obviously fared quite well through all this. We've seen, you know, you know, last year coming out of Chinese New Year when China shut down, that was a little scary for us. Um, we did the the, um, the the response that India had to COVID uh, was was probably the most painful because they were shutting down a lot of our facilities uh, for weeks at a time, and, and we make some pretty critical. Uh, products in India, uh, some are medical related, and uh, and they didn't have the same approach that we did in the U.S., where you could declare yourself essential. Um, and so we we ended up having to shut down some assembly lines in the U.S. because we couldn't get pieces and parts out of India. Um, and we're actually going to because of that, uh, we're actually going to have to move some products out of India because that's something that we can't ever let happen again. Um, our U.S. facilities have actually uh, has have done well. Uh, we've, like everybody, we've had cases, uh, but we haven't had any do any any mass quarantines or shutting down of any facilities. It's always been one here or one there, uh, and and we've done a lot of work uh, in the company to make sure everybody feels safe uh, and is safe. And you know, and, and I, I think our our team's done a great job on that front. So. Um, you know, other, other than that, I think, uh, you know, 95% or better of our, our customer base, it would be characterized as essential. And 
from a from a business perspective, I think we've had most of our many of our customers have have seen increases. You know, certainly we're doing a lot more ventilators and respirators now than than we were in past years. Uh, we're doing more in the um, home fitness that we we weren't expecting. That's actually been quite phenomenal. Uh, so overall, we've we've benefited. I you know I hate to say it like that, but I mean that we've we've been very very busy um, because of this. And have there been any? new devices, something new that people have approached you with that's COVID related that um, you're now taking on? Any uh, new kinds of devices, uh, you know, new kinds of electronics? We're working on one project, which is kind of interesting. Uh, we're, we're doing a, a uh, it's another ventilator, but it's a, it's a low cost ventilator that would be used in third world so the, the ventilator projects that we do today are for big, it's for a Fortune 100 company that are sold all over the US. Um, there's another project we're working on, which is a low cost ventilator that would be largely given away into third world countries through charitable um, organizations. And so that's that we're pretty excited about that one. Interesting, interesting. Jay, do you just want to comment a little bit about uh, uh, what, Gulfstream's done during the pandemic to help the community, to help Savannah. Um, anything that you focused on? Have you been asked to produce anything other than uh, aviation products uh, during this time? We we have, and, and um, we've done. Well, I guess really three three categories of things. We've helped with the educational piece, just getting the word out of word out in the communities as to the best protective measures, etc. That was much more important earlier on than it is these days. I think that message is out there quite nicely. Uh, beyond that, we've we've bought and donated, um, particularly early in the in the pandemic, uh, large volumes of hand sanitizer to make available to uh, to those who might otherwise have it. Uh, we have we with our manufacturing operations are not particularly well suited to most of our manufacturing operations are not particularly well suited to anything other than building airplanes. Uh, the one exception to that or primary exception to that is our 3d printing capability we have some pretty sophisticated uh, and high volume 3d printers which we've used uh, to print uh, tools for lack of a better better term that yeah. that um, uh, that help with the pandemic related items and the, the the quick example is one of our bright energetic engineers came up with a design of a of a tool that's about three or four inches long that it could be used to open doors, whether it's a doorknob or any any of the common configurations of, of of you know door opening devices where you could use that tool to open the door without ever having to touch the door. And so we've we've produced that and distributed it uh, not not only internally but uh, outside, including to the the uh, New York um, uh, fire departments. Fascinating, absolutely fascinating. I know we just have a couple minutes left. Anything, Scott, Jay, we haven't discussed that you'd want to raise, want to bring up around manufacturing? Uh, you know, we, we've, we've covered the gamut, uh, uh, but uh, uh, anything else that we haven't raised, haven't discussed that you think uh, would be important to do so before we uh, close the session? I'm good, uh, good, great conversation. Barry, thank you very much, nicely done. Oh. Oh, thank you. It's been fascinating for, for me as a lay person to, uh, uh, so I want to, uh, Jay, last, anything else you want to add? Uh, the only thing I'd like to add is to emphasize the, you know, at the university levels and through the technical colleges, high schools, et cetera, let's continue to, to, to refine our focus on making sure that what we're teaching our students is something they can apply directly and immediately when they hit the workforce. Okay, well, important message. And uh, hopefully those that can make a difference and, uh, and make this happen are listening. So uh, uh, we'll carry it. Thank you, uh, Scott. Thank you, Jay, for joining us today. Thank you, guys. I really appreciate I mean, Jay, uh, Scott, and Barry for making this session very interesting. Uh, thank you for your participation, your time. We will stay in touch for our future programs. 